prelude this morning is um, called Prayer for Unity, and it was written by Kevin Kyle. so much, Bruce. That was lovely. Good morning. Welcome to the Treasure Coast Unitarian Universal Congregation in Stewart, Florida. Today is November 15th, 2020. My name is Ronnie Dombowski, and I will be your worship associate today. We are happy to have our guest minister, Reverend Jennifer de Bruce Alver. Uh, is wait just a minute. I think I I keep having to say her name, but it's Alviar. Excuse me. Is an ordained Unitarian Universalist minister who received her Masters of Divinity degree at Star King School for Ministry in Berkeley, California. She is a community bridge builder in the broadest sense. Her specialty as a minister is to cultivate positive relationships with schools, churches, and nonprofits. These partnerships are designed to empower youth to become strong leaders and caring citizens throughout the community outreach project. Reverend Al Viar is a member at East Shore Unitarian Church located on the traditional territory of the indigenous Duwash and coastal Salish peoples, currently known as Bellevue, Washington. I would like to thank everybody that helped put this service together. Bruce Ruby, our music director, our Zoom host, Karina Poloni, and our backup, Janet Grove. We are a welcoming congregation. We welcome people of all gender identities, races, ages, and background. Thank you for joining us today. We hold Zoom services every Sunday at 11 a.m. Announcements are in our Friday online newsletter. Please add our services to your calendar for every Sunday. We would love you to join us each week. To be put on our email list or to find out more information about us, go to our website at tcuuc.org. In the Friday newsletter, there will be a link you can use to get into the following Sunday Zoom service. While you were there, notice the link for online giving. Even though our building is currently closed, we still have many expenses and would love it if you could share some of your hard-earned money with us. Of course, you could always mail a check. That's always welcome also. Our address is 21 East Central Parkway, Stewart, Florida, 34997. And thank you for anything that you can do. 
Now I will be lighting the chalice as I say a few words, but since I can't do both, both together, you'll have to wait a second. Put there. May the glow of this chal chalice bring us together in love, hope, and understanding. Now I'm gonna just move it to the back table so I don't burn my nose. Now my opening words. In these hard times, let us look first to the response of love. In the midst of challenge, may our chalice flame bear witness to the inherent worth and dignity to every human being. In the midst of uncertainty, may our chalice be a beacon of encouragement that our values may guide our choices. Let us look first to the response of love. Maureen Kelleran. Now Bruce will play and sing for us. It's hymn 121, We'll Build a Land. Thank you. Peace, the 
Let us recite our affirmation, speaking the first verse and singing the second. Love is the spirit of this church and service is its law. This is our great covenant to dwell together in peace, to seek the truth in love and to help one another. Now we will have a video for Time for All Ages called Snow Stone Soup. <laughs> that was so lovely. I loved that. It was actually wonderful. Now it's time for us to share our joys and sorrows. As a caring community, we want to hear your joys and your sorrows, so let's share them. I will move a stone from to our symbolic river, which I have next to me, to mark each joy and sorrow. Okay, well, thank you all for sharing. Um, for those joys and sorrows that are too private to share, know that our hearts are with you. I will put a stone in for this. Good morning. I am honored to be with you and thank you for everyone's joys and sorrows. And I hold everyone here in this time of a community and fellowship. I'd like to share with you a reading that's called, Aren't We All One Family? Spirit of ages, light of life. We gather today from many traditions and many ways of life to speak with one strong voice, to give thanks and to worship together. Let our prayer be heard, for aren't we all one family with the same wants and needs? Help us to strive for a healthy planet, to work towards peaceful, loving relationships with all of humankind, to achieve our vision of seeing all people fed in body and nourished in soul, sheltered from the rain and free from unnecessary fears. Let our thanks be heard for aren't we all one family with the same joys and sorrows? Hear our praise of love and beauty, accept our gratitude for the promise of children, hearken to our songs of celebration, for music, for learning, for the solid earth beneath our feet, and for the clear, distant sky above, we offer thanks. Let our efforts be forever intertwined, for aren't we all one family, gathered here this day, together, grateful for the warmth and recognition we find in one another's hearts and faces. Thus we pray, and thus we offer thanks, and thus we love. So be it. Amen. I invite us into a contemplative time of meditation. May we gather our bodies, minds, hearts, and spirits into a place of stillness. Uh, this image before you is of a community garden. May this image lead us to reflect on Thanksgiving, a season of food, fellowship, and gratitude for each other and the earth. I will now ring the first chime to call us into silence. At the second chime, Bruce will lead us into the hymn, Spirit of Life.
Now let us enjoy a sermon by the Reverend Jennifer Alvear. Thank you, Ronnie. I would like to begin with a prayer. This prayer is to honor the challenging times we find ourselves in as a nation. It is a way to properly set the table in this virtual space so that all people and all emotions are invited, acknowledged, and affirmed. Let us pray. During this time of heightened political tension, may we create a sacred space of inclusion and hospitality. The chairs of power and authority continue to shift. May people's sense of place and belong, or many people's sense of place and belonging feels uncertain, perhaps threatened. In a world where chairs are too often pulled out from underneath us, may we model the kind of hospitality that invites us to pull up a chair for others and say, come, sit, make yourself at home. You are welcome here. Now that the welcome table has been properly set, the question becomes this, how can we nourish the soul of a nation hungering for peace, justice, and healing? This is a big question, I realize. So perhaps we start with bite-sized pieces. As you may recall from the stone soup story shared earlier in the worship service, Two shabby-looking travelers visit a quaint village, knocking on doors, requesting food. Although the villagers have enough food to share, they look upon the travelers with suspicion. Suspicion towards these strangers, folks not like them, not from these parts, creates division, an us-versus-them mentality. Distrust leads to fear. Fear, in turn, causes the villagers to respond to these strangers with a spirit of scarcity versus generosity. It is our natural instinct, if not a charitable one, to protect our own. However, these travelers are no ordinary folk. They offer a priceless gift that the villagers need in plunking a stone in a large pot of hot water, they provide an opportunity for people to recognize and contribute their own unique ingredient of worth, dignity, and value to the larger community. This collective effort transforms scarcity into generosity, division into unity. Bring what you've got, put it in this in the pot, we're making stone soup. The secret ingredient, sharing, helps to feed and heal this community. In what ways might we translate this stone soup story into our own local community? How might we nourish the soul of a nation hungering for peace, justice, and healing? This question is relevant in the face of racial injustice, a global pandemic and political tensions that are sharply dividing our country. It is also timely as we near Thanksgiving, a season of food, fellowship, and forgiveness. Let us hold these tensions with grace as we explore ways to move towards greater healing together. Our Unitarian Universalist faith tradition has designed an excellent year-long racial justice curriculum training called Beloved Conversation. It is strategically designed to bring congregants together in small groups to engage in meaningful discussions around systems of oppression and how we can work collaboratively towards a more liberating future of anti-racism. 
One of the most valuable insights I have gained from this program is this. Effective leadership is grounded in relationships of trust and shared power. This sounds beautiful, right? But it's not easy, especially when power is shared across racial lines. Let me help unpack this and provide some context from my own personal location and family upbringing as a white female religious leader. My father is Professor Emeritus of Cardiology on a university campus with a great love for books, words, and ideas. My mother founded a collaborative leadership program with guiding principles around shared power with leaders from grassroots organizations, government, the arts, corporations, and nonprofits. I recognize how this fusion between the world of ideas and the world of service has shaped my own ministry. Today, I serve as a Unitarian Universalist community minister. I have the honor and privilege of cultivating positive relationships with schools, churches, and nonprofits designed to teach leadership skills to youth through community service projects. Given my family upbringing, my faith tradition, and my chosen vocation, it seems as though my life were one smooth, seamless, coherent whole, especially when we consider our UU principles about being an inclusive, welcoming faith tradition of deeds and actions, not creeds and dogmas. I particularly appreciate Treasure Coast UU Congregation's description. We are brave, curious, and compassionate thinkers and doers. What is not to love about a mission statement like that? Sometimes, however, we need someone with contrasting perspectives to hold up a mirror that challenges our beliefs and assumptions. My husband is that mirror for me. Christopher is a first-generation immigrant from the Philippines. While I speak in the language of words and service, he speaks in the language of food and fellowship. From his perspective, if you want to show love, you put food on the table. If you want to make a difference in the world, you feed people at the meeting tables organized to enact social change. He pairs food with wine. I pair sermons with hymns, readings, and meditations. We share a complimentary marriage. Christopher's second and most valuable critique is this. Don't be influenced by well-crafted words artfully expressed. Make sure that words are followed by clear, direct actions, especially around race, power, and leadership. In our most recent Beloved Conversation session of racial justice, the topic was focused on power sharing and followership. Take, for example, our General Assembly in 2020. You, you, the vote held an interview with Isis Gill, Development and Finance, Finance Director of Puente Arizona Human Rights Movement, along with Janine Gelsinger, UU Justice Arizona Director. Isis is a Latinx leader. Janine is a white leader. These two leaders work collaboratively together around immigration rights. This interview highlights both the possibilities and challenges of effective power sharing across racial lines. In this interview, Janine asks Isis, what makes a good partner. Isis responds, a willingness to show up and do what is asked of you, not necessarily what you would like to do. Take daycare, for example. Having you use provide daycare afforded us so much more power that allowed us to talk to our own community members 
and really develop systems to tackle important issues in agencies in Arizona around immigration rights. This is a good example of a strong partnership. It shows what it means to stand in solidarity with us as an organization, specifically when you're taking care of children. Janine replies, speaking to you use, I will say that that took humility on our part. There were many folks who were saying, we don't want to watch the kids. We want to help organize the protests. We want to be on the front lines. We want to do the sexy work of organizing. But when a partner says to you, you know, what would actually be valuable is if you watch the kids so we can have the meeting and plan the strategy. Then that is what you show up to do. This reminds me of Lin-Manuel Miranda's musical, Hamilton. Many white UUs seem to be singing Aaron Burr's song, The Room Where It Happens. As tempting as it may be to center ourselves in the room where it happens, our UU faith tradition calls us to center Black, Indigenous, and other people of color, BIPOC, for collaborative leadership. After all, they are the ones who are most impacted and offer the greatest wisdom and truth grounded in their lived experiences of racial injustice. Janine continues the discussion and asks, what else is a good partner to you? Isis replies, your ability to show up and then step back. When we talk to you use, they're very educated, older, more experienced individuals than we have with our youth first to the country and generation. There is a lot more wisdom and depth in the congregation, but the reality is that all of these individuals have the impacted knowledge that education cannot give you. There has to be some type of middle ground in which we really utilize the experience and wisdom that you all bring in while having those who have been most impacted be in charge. A lot of that really does have to be a huge humility moment. Letting younger individuals speak to you to lead a fight that may not necessarily have the same terminology or even the vocabulary to be able to articulate everything that needs to be done in the mission, but understands the tactical decision-making that needs to be done. This is the kind of faithful, accountable partnerships that white UUs need to model across racial lines. When we place our own ambitions and agenda before those of our BIPOC partners, we are doing so at the expense of cultivating trusting relationships. In short, we are power hoarding versus power sharing. This break in trust leads to distrust, anger, and fuels division. We need to humble ourselves and take turns in leading and following, talking and listening. Beloved Conversations offered another valuable, concrete example of collaborative leadership from The View, a weekly Unitarian Universalist talk show from the Church of the Larger Fellowship. Reverend Meg Riley asks religious leader, religious educator, Asha Hauser, and Reverend Deanna Vandiver this question. How is collaborative leadership an antidote to oppression? Asha is an immigrant from Egypt. Reverend Deanna is a white religious leader. The two of them are writing a book together on this topic called Collaborative Leadership for Collective Liberation. Reverend Deanna 
highlights a moment of struggle during her time at the Center for Ethical Living and Social Justice Renewal. This nonprofit was originally set up in the traditional top-down hierarchical model. Reverend Deanna served as the executive director, while Ruth Aydukala, a black woman, served as the office manager. Things were not working out well. A facilitator asked, have you thought about co-directorship? Reverend Deanna fully embraced this idea. She said, collaborative leadership is true faith practice. There were things that we were able to co-create out of a collaborative model of leadership that just could not have happened in the hierarchical structure. The way we were able to unpack a lot of the systemic racism around us and within us, how white supremacy was showing up, superiority, inferiority, peeling the layers out of the larger structures. She says, I give thanks to the People's Institute for Survival and Beyond. Their undoing racism training is excellent. We developed all kinds of strategies. Someone would walk into the room and look to me, the white woman, and assume I'm the one in charge versus the other woman of color. Ruth became the person who signed the checks. If you wanna get paid, You've got to talk to the black woman in the room. We had to really talk about what was happening so we could understand these dynamics. That is so much the power of white supremacy. Silence is what's really happening. A collaborative model allows for a dynamic flow of leadership and honest dialogue, whereas a static, hierarchical top-down model of leadership has a damaging, pot damaging potential to foster silence. In many ways, collaborative leadership comes down to a posture of forgiveness and humility. George Herbert wrote, he who cannot forgive others destroys the bridge over which he himself must pass. None of us makes it through this life without our own share of human pain and suffering, whether we are willing to admit it or not. We all need to forgive ourselves and each other for being mere mortals. For too long, we have lived in oppressive systems that glorify individualism and perfectionism. This leads to a culture of impatience for complex situations that will not yet be realized and solved in the immediate future. No one individual will be the, less, will be the best leader for all situations. No one individual will have all the answers. But if we have the courage and humility to shift this top-down model of leadership towards a collaborative model of shared power in partnership with BIPOC folks, then I believe the future is ripe with possibility. It brings to mind our UU hymn, Building Bridges. Listen to these lyrics. Building bridges between our divisions I reach out to you, will you reach out to me? With all of our voices and all of our visions, friends, we could make such sweet harmony. How do we nourish the soul of a nation hungering for peace, justice, and healing? It seems to me that collaborative, <clears throat> excuse me, that collaborative leadership across racial lines is a good place to begin. May it be so. Blessed be, amen, ashe.
I invite you to join me in our next hymn. It's hymn 128. Thank you. For all that is our life. Bless you. Thanks. <laughs> beautiful. Thank you, Bruce. I'd like to share a benediction for closing words. No matter how weak or how frightened we may, we may feel, we each have gifts that can make a difference in the world. In this coming week, may you do at least one thing to support the broken, to welcome the stranger, to celebrate what is worthy, to do the work of justice and love. Be strong, be connected, each day act, so you may be a little more whole. And now I'm going to extinguish the flame, but not our love. After the postlude, please place yourself in gallery mode and stay with us for our coffee hour. You can bring a cup of coffee with it, you, or you can just visit. Now Bruce will do the postlude. The postlude is blessed be the tie that binds. Thank you.